I'm debuting for my country and then I'm playing a game two weeks later for my country again in New Zealand. No one had any time to like criticize me or analyze me. So in a way, I didn't get a chance to put pressure on myself after playing well in game one. I reflect on that debut and just go, we play a game of rugby union where there are rules and I didn't follow any of them. <laughs> Scrum started to turn. I just go, I'll follow the scrum and the ball all the way to the other side of the field. If they'd swung back, there would have been space where I was meant to be because no one else holds your space. I just follow the ball, lucky enough to get off the line and get an intercept. If we don't practice going for intercepts, like why I thought this is what I should do, no idea. <laughs> and the coach afterwards was like, if you didn't get that intercept, we were in so much trouble. And I was like, oh, well, lucky I did. If you reflect on like how much we overthink things and how much we put pressure on ourselves, the way I played, I didn't have any pressure on myself. On today's episode of the Agency Podcast, joining us is Emily Chancellor. She currently plays for the New South Wales Waratahs as well as nationally for the Australian Wallaroos in the women's team. Recently, she's dealt with the injury of having an ACL tear and what it takes to bounce back mentally when it comes to training, mindset, and overcoming adversity to get back on the field playing the sport that she loves. I really enjoyed this and I hope you guys take away some of the lessons that I personally took from this episode. Let's dive in. Emily, welcome to the pod. Excited to have you here with us today. Thanks so much, Dane. I am honored to be a part of it. We're pumped, man. And you've got a lot going on in your world right now. And I understand that you've unfortunately broken your foot uh, in the past and more recently torn your ACL. Yes. Yeah. I was yeah. going to say, broken my foot. Wow. We're taking a deep dive back <laughs> into 2017. But no, ACL is unfortunately the injury I'm I don't want to say dealing with, but, you know, moving through the process of, of recovering from at the moment. It's a tough one because I, I understand, and Cam was explaining this to me before, you have to essentially stretch the the muscle and like reattach it. And it's quite probably one of the most challenging injuries you could get in sport. It is one of the probably, I don't know if it's the, the like it's not the worst injury you could get in sport, but it's one of the longest time frames to return from. So it's, then along, like any time you're out of sport, sucks. And then to say that this injury is basically a nine to 12 month injury makes it even worse because there's nothing you can really do to speed up the process. Like a lot of people are trying to in the professional world, but the re-rupture rate is so high if you come back early. So it's just not really worth it at the moment. So you have to take it easy. Uh, and yeah. Easy, sure. Yeah, oh, not <laughs> take it easy, but you have yeah. to, let me reframe that question. Like you have to nurse it effectively you can't yeah. um you can't rest on it you have to be very diligent and try yeah. to you know incrementally improve it over yeah. time but it is definitely an injury that they say you have to go slow at the start and for most athletes or most people it's not easy to go slow right after you've done something that feels like it's traumatic and you shouldn't you know you want to be in control again so what do you want to do you want to overdo something so in that first sort of six to 12 weeks, you're like, I wanna, I'm going to be back. I'm going to be back. <laughs> what can I do extra? And they're like, just sit, just try and get a little bit of bend. Like it's just that slow like, What process. are you talking about, Ben? I want to win the championship. <laughs> exactly. I want to be back <laughs> on that bloody field right now with my team. Yeah. And with that comes, I guess, the, the challenge of perseverance, adversity and, and what have you. Um, how has this, I guess, reshaped your mindset and your approach to your professional career? Um, and you know, how do you summon mental fortitude to actually deal with it? It's a hard one. Cause I don't think you can ever answer it until you're in it. Like everyone knows injuries suck. I always think injuries, no matter big or smaller, like a good opportunity to reflect on where you are, where you're going and really make sure that you're doing it because you want to do it. Cause sometimes you can, well, I haven't had this experience yet, but I believe sometimes if you're not doing something for long enough, you kind of get that like why am I trying to come back for it? But I think I always try to use an injury as like the refuel of fire of like, I want to come back bigger and better. I want to come back because I want to be back there, not because I just want to get not injured anymore. Like I want to come back with a vengeance a little bit more, more to prove. So having a nice long nine to 12 month period at the moment 
has been a really cool process from a mental perspective to go, well, how do you accept where you are, but then also not get overwhelmed with the fact that you're in a 12 month injury? Like, how do you find things to be motivated to do each, you know, each week or each fortnight and what are the wins? Can I celebrate the fact that now I can hop on one leg or I've just changed direction or whatever it might be? Could be as small as like I got from 90 degrees to 100 degrees in my bend, you know, like whatever those small little wins are, taking those and like celebrating them just like you would in a week to week with a team sport, you know, or or any, any sport in competition where you are used to being sort of outcome driven and that's your game on the weekend, but instead you're changing it to like, okay, I'm at week six, my goal should be this based off, you know, this, the data. So that's, I, I'm all about the mindset on it and the physical stuff is a bonus because that's going to come with it. And I, and I imagine as an athlete, like, like you said before, like you are on the hunt for the next win, the next score, you know, the next uh, moment to celebrate and you're trying to take that concept into the recovery stage. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. And have how do you feel like this has maybe reshaped your mind having to, I guess, sit with your thoughts a little bit more and be like less in your body and being hyperactive and being more conscious and planned uh, and potentially slowing down a little bit with, with how much you can uh, outlet through your body? Yeah, it's really hard. You know, I don't play a team sport to train by myself, but to be able to then go, okay, I'm focusing purely on me right now. Like it might be with a bigger goal of being back in a team, but ultimately it's a selfish time. It is a time to slow down and really like get comfortable being uncomfortable with yourself. Um, As I said before, just making sure that you're doing it because you actually want to be back out there. Like it's, it's a really good reminder. And I'm, I'm so lucky at the moment that I'm doing this with another girl in my team who unfortunately has the same injury as me a month or so earlier. So we're about on the same time frame. But if I was genuinely by myself through this process, it would have been a lot harder, I think, just going through the emotional journey completely solo because, yes, people have done it before. Yes, they also know how you feel, but you don't want that compassion from someone that's already back doing what you want to do. Like Mm -hmm. when you want to be there, no one else can understand it. Like you don't want you don't want them to understand. Like they don't understand where you're, what you're feeling right now. So I'm so lucky that I have another girl in the same position as me in my team who also plays for Australia who on the days that I'm like, fuck, this sucks, she's like, hey, what about tomorrow? Like mm. are you sure you don't want to do that session today because you'll, you'll be disappointed in yourself tomorrow? And like – to have someone that can bounce those thoughts off with you, even though I would say like I'm pretty strong-minded and and could do it by myself, having that external, you know, opportunity of that, like the value there to just challenge you slightly on those moments where you could give up is unreal because I know I'm there for her in exactly the same capacity when she's going, I don't want to, like I'm, I'm not able to run, this is so frustrating, I'm like, think about the long game, you know, like we're here for the right reason. What else can we focus on? How can we shift this to be positive? So I'm really like, it's such an interesting mind game individually, but then even in a two person environment, like I have a team. So you just got to try and find the best of the bad. Um, because ultimately like it's a choice. You can kick, sit around and kick stones, feel sorry for yourself for nine to 12 months, or you can make this like the best experience ever. And that's what I'm trying to do. I don't think I would ever turn around and say that this 12 months has been the best 12 months of my life. But with everything that's like every sort of lost opportunity becomes another opportunity to Mm -hmm. be able to look at. And I think like I'm a little bit older than most girls running around the field at the moment. Um, So maybe my body just needed a rest. Like maybe the, like I do believe things happen for reasons and I'm not particularly religious or anything, but I do believe that there's like there's some kind of spiritualness there. I agree with that. And I think oftentimes, you know, in the world of business or whether you're an athlete or what have you, things come up and in the moment they're just brutal, they suck. 
and you know you're you're faced with something that is is tremendously difficult to overcome. I liken it to you know something one of my mentors once said to me, and he said that day in every every setback is an opportunity for a great comeback. As cliche as it sounds, it's how you come back is is definitive of your character. And, you know, in these times, I imagine right now you're developing a lot of character. You're realizing the power of community and sharing something that you're struggling with with someone else who's going through the same thing. Regarding your friend, what's her name, by the way? Adiana Talkai. Shout out. Shout um, out. And, uh, you know, it's awful that she's in the same predicament, but it just shines a light on how powerful it is to rally people at have an experience of what you're experiencing. Um, so you can have accountability. You can have someone help have that honest conversation with you. What what have been other examples of that throughout your career where there have been other struggles and then you've sought counsel or support from others? I suppose like the obvious one is not making teams or not being selected in something where you think you should be. And that's a magical, it's a really interesting place. And I think it's something that we all do in, in the world where like, you kind of take the feedback or the information you're given and use it how you feel, not how it was actually given because it makes you feel better. So when you get feedback from a coach for, you know, this week you're on the bench or sorry, you're not going to go to the World Cup or whatever it might be, you know, I, I'll give my example for 2017 World Cup. I was a stay-at-home reserve and the feedback that I heard and that I, I hold true is he said, the coach said to me, Emily, we're playing against the biggest teams in the world. We need to take the biggest team. And I was like, well, this is bullshit. I'm the size I am. I'm not going to be able to change. I can't get taller. I'm not going to be any better if I'm 10 kilos heavier. So if I can make my tackles, like surely I'm good enough to be there. So I, I walked around with a chip on my shoulder for a little bit thinking, fuck him. Like, <laughs> why would you say that? Why would you pick something that I can't control? Mm. When I think genuinely back to that conversation with a little bit less emotion, do I think he actually said it in that way? Probably not. But did I use that as my driver? Yes. But does that mean that it's actually the constructive conversation that I've taken? Probably not. Like, you know, we always take, we create stories to fit our narrative. What works for us? Is it someone gets told, oh, I don't know, you, you're not physical enough. Well, instead of me being like, well, uh, like you could take it and be like, okay, well, how? Like, but because you can go poor me all the time with every conversation, I think that that's, I don't even know what your question was there, but I'm this is a great, a great freestyle here. No, I, I, I'm hearing what you're saying. I think, you know, in those moments where, you know, people share something that puts a chip on your shoulder, it, it's like, was it taken out of context? And mm. how am I taking that piece and then engineering it into my own narrative? Mm. And I think people do this in business. They do this in life. They do this in, you know, sports. For you, have, at what point in your career did you catch on to the fact that, hey, maybe like, that the narrative I'm building in my mind um, isn't 100% accurate. And then do you engineer it to kind of, do you create chips on your shoulder? Is that something that helps? I'm not a particularly malicious person, so I don't <laughs> think that I like to create chips. But I do, like, you've got to have something that creates a fire because we're in a competitive world. Everything you have to have some kind of competitiveness to. And I... I think possibly I've realized it from talking to friends who have gone through, you know, the, the, the tough parts of selections. I've been, since making the team in 2018, the, the Australian team in 2018, I've missed very few games. In fact, I've only missed one game due to selection when I've been eligible to play since 2018. So I've been pretty bloody lucky. I don't think that luck is... A standalone comment, but you listen to your your teammates go through hardship through selection and and the way this they tell the story. And I think that you know taking perspective from other people is also important to how you shape yourself because you're going to be in those situations as well. It's the same environment, like preparing yourself, creating your own armor, 
Like you ha- if you ca- if you're only relying on your own experience to create yourself, it's the world's going to be a really tough place when you mm-hmm. have your first experience of that. Like, you know, we talk about hardship. This is completely off topic, but you go down like a hardship of of life, and you think, well, for me, reflectively, I've had a really great upbringing. Does that mean that I'm not allowed to have thought about how it would be for someone else so that when when they've had a harder life and they've had to build resilience, I've had to build resilience from listen, listening and learning so that then if I get a hardship, it's not like, oh, at 25 you get your first hardship and I'm going to crumble because I've never had that before. Like you still have to build resilience from other people's experience. So I think taking that reflective side is something that I do a lot of with the people around me. Mm. I would agree. It's almost like how you hear things and adapt them to yourself shapes your quality. And there's this really great uh, riff that I read in a book recently called The 10X Rule. I don't know if you've read it. Great book. It's written by a guy named Grant Cardone. And he says that, you know, trying to operate as a professional, but then use, you know, victimhood as justification as to why you're not doing well is kind of like having a business card and handing it to someone and say, hey, I'm a full-time athlete, mm-hmm. part-time victim. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> do you think that like um, the victim mindset can really unravel someone's career as an athlete? Yes, 100% it can. The victim mindset is like the toxic sort of, I don't know, snake that comes into any environment, right? As soon as you're a victim, poor me exists and you can pull you you down, but all also can pull the people around you down and like that's that team environment part of sport that or team sport that makes it such a uh, volatile environment it it's you're you're never safe in a team environment because all it takes is one person to start tipping the edge of it one way positive or negative and you can you go on this you know roller coaster ride so yes the poor me victim side can tip you and it can catch you off guard right and you know regarding your injury and how you're i guess handling at the moment you're you're taking quite an optimistic positive let's get the work done approach to it where did the ability to reframe yourself around your injuries and this kind of mindset like where did it come from Mm, it probably has just come from like general life experience like being a female athlete, playing a male dominated sport, I think there's a little element of like, you know, I found I found rugby when I was 21 at university, never played it before. I'd always watched it and I just like just thought it'd be really cool to learn how to tackle <laughs> someone. It's really the honesty. Just like, had the urge. Yeah, well, yeah. I'd always watched it. I only knew that men could play it because I only ever saw men playing it. So I didn't think, geez, this is something – I want to do. I, I dreamt about being asked to play for like the Waratahs from the grandstand as a six year old kid, but never did I think it was actually something that was an option. And then when you learn that you could try it, I'm like, hell yeah, this would be so fun to look, just, just see if I can. Like, I just want to be tackled. I just want to learn how to like do that. <laughs> but I digress. Being in that, that space where you're kind of you know, there's a stigma of like, oh, this, is, this isn't this is really where you're supposed to be. It's not normal to be a girl playing rugby. And I'm not talking so much today. I feel like we're, we're in a shifting time, which is nice. But, you know, 10, 15 years ago when I started, it wasn't normal. Like played at Sydney University and I remember a couple of the old men that were big supporters of the, the men's club being like, oh, but why are the women doing that? They're not supposed to. So there's always this like, you know, you have to kind of stroke an ego but also be confident in what you're doing because if you turn around and we're like, well, we should be doing this, you become that preaching person that no one ends up listening to. So, you know, you have to sort of think about how you're going to have this conversation with this lovely old man who has a perception of something but also try and change it. Mm. And so I think that like that kind of environment has always meant that, you know, I, I, 
I wouldn't say I'm a feminist, but I think, you know, that equality is really important. And that's sort of where my angle has always come from is like, well, you should be given a chance. So why can't you? And so I don't know how that leads to where we are now, but. Well, you make a good point there. Like it's challenging a narrative, you yeah. know, and for whatever reason, there's, you know, a previous generation's cultural bias toward what sport is and how it should be played and all the rest of it. And I definitely feel like we're in an era where that's really changing and evolving. What's been your experience um, watching, I guess, professional sports, you know, that were predominantly uh, televised for men only, essentially, now really shine a spotlight on women and allowing new careers to take place and allowing sports to really be seen and, you know, uh, in on a global stage? Like what's been your experience with that? Yeah, it's unreal. Like it's just cool to, to be able to see young girls now looking at a variety of sports that were traditionally male sports to be able to say like I I could do that. That's what I want to do, be it water polo, be it soccer, be it rugby union, rugby league, like all of them are AFL. They're all appearing in that contact sport world where traditionally a young girl couldn't look up to a role model of of that looked like them and say, I want to be like that. So, you know, the cliche, you can't be what you can't see, I completely believe in. And I kind of feel like as we've gone through in our little generation of female rugby players that that's, that's kind of been one of the messages that we've been trying to share of like, like I didn't have a female role model in rugby union. In fact, I can't give you one that I haven't played with. So that generational shift is different, whereas there are like young girls. I met someone last week at a presentation night who came up to me and was like, I looked up to you when you were playing rugby. Well, you are playing rugby. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I looked up to you, you know, 10 years ago and watched you play and thought I want to do that too. And I think that's like that's a, that's a shift. That's something mm. that I didn't get that they get now. And, you know, it that sort of drives you to be – better to to want to keep thinking about your image to want to keep like growing the game because they will be the ones doing it for the future as well yeah because i you know imagine that a lot of men that play you know professional sports now uh in you know union and so on they would have grown up with posters on the wall of you know they are heroes, like the people that they wanted to become. And you're essentially highlighting that the fact that you didn't really have that as a child, but now you're stepping into this role as a role model. And now you're potentially going to have your poster on the wall in a little girl's room somewhere. And 10, 15 years from now, she might play professionally because of your inspiration. I'd love to be on someone's wall as a poster. <laughs> That'd be pretty cool. Just build your own. We can do the branding. <laughs> we got you. Uh, let's get some posters out there. <laughs> I actually just want to say I did truly have role models growing up. They were just men. Like yeah. I have posters of Adam Ashley Cooper, Lottie, Lottie Takiri, you know, Chris Whitaker. They were all the people that I watched playing rugby union and thought, oh, my God, like I want to, I want to be like you even though maybe that's wrong. I admire you. Mm. Cause I didn't think that I could, you know, I then had like netballers that I, I was like, Oh, that's cool. Like Liz Ellis, I could, I could play netball for Australia, but I never thought, Oh, I could play rugby union for Australia. Big change because I, I understand, um, before university you were playing netball mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden you're now, you know, transitioning sports. What was that transition like going from something like netball into tackling people? <laughs> well, it's a, it's a good question. I actually grew up as a swimmer. So I did a lot of that individual sport through primary school, all of high school. I was like 11 times a week in the pool, diligent, 5am wake ups, playing netball as my like, oh, it's fun because it's a team sport. Like it's a little bit different. I'm outdoors. Netball became my like secondary sport through high school and then I was I realized that team sport was probably where I wanted to be so then netball became my okay let's invest the time in this was sort of competing in rep spaces but never really was like damn I want to play for Australia in the diamonds like that was never like big goal like I was like oh that'd be nice on a scholarship at Sydney Uni playing netball 
a come try rugby day gets mentioned as an as an option me and my best friend who I was playing netball with we were like it'd be kind of cool <laughs> said that before like just just to learn how to tackle I played netball I ended up on the ground a lot because I got in trouble for contact wing defense center like it kind of like when I look back at it, I'm like, it makes so much sense. Like this game was made for me. Um, <laughs> I played a little bit of water polo at high school and hated it. Thought like that would be my sport. Mix netball and swimming in the water. Happy days. Terrible. <laughs> it was horrible because the contact happens away from the ball and that's okay. Whereas in rugby union, the, the contact can only happen if you have the ball. And I think, you know, then you can rest when you're not. But water polo, when you were resting, that's when you got drowned. Um, and then rugby union, it was just I, as soon as I learned how to tackle, like this is the coolest thing ever. <laughs> like it is a physical game. It's a mental game. You have to build this relationship with your teammates instantly because when you think about the like basic game of rugby union, it is 15 people standing on one side of the field saying, thou shalt not pass yeah. and doing everything that they can to stop the person with the ball or the team with the ball from getting past them to score a try. So if you can't do it for the person next to you, they're not going to do it for you either. So you have to build this like connection instantly of respect because you're all putting your body on the line. You have to work in a system and like build strategy and then walk off a field and be okay with not hitting someone again. Like it's just this really, I don't know, the holistic thing of like mind, body, like energy that you have to give to the game is something that I'd never experienced before. So I got hooked on it so easily from just that, like the camaraderie, probably the fact that it was a small environment and the fact that you – get off the field after playing against people who you've, you know, done everything to not hurt but stop and be physical with and then you get off the field, shake hands, have a hug and you're also almost instantly respectful friends. Mm. I think that that's something that I've not really experienced in the sporting world other than in that rugby union space. And. As an athlete who's played professionally in sevens and fifteens rugby, and for those listening, sevens is where it's seven on seven and fifteens is fifteen on fifteen. Can you explain the difference in playing styles and the dynamics on how they're both different? Yeah, so sevens is probably well, it's the shortened version of the game for entertainment's sake. So it's a faster game, more tries in a shorter amount of time. So it's a 14 minute game which means that then on the same size field you have to be faster, stronger, more technical, I suppose, to play the game. because More explosive energy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because in sevens you've got, you know, if you spread seven people across a field that's a roughly 70 metres wide, that's one person per 10 metres. So you've got 10 metres of space. You're doing everything basically by yourself. So if you miss your tackle, it's a try. Whereas in 15s you usually don't line 15 people straight along the field, but you've got, you know, maybe 12. So you've halved your number of people, the number of space between each person. So you're now down to like a five metre space and you've got three people behind you. So if you make a mistake, there's still someone there to pick up the pieces, which makes the game a little bit slower, but it also means that you've got opportunity to sort of redeem yourself, get back, like get one back on someone or build strategy to create opportunity based off what you're seeing. So I think the sevens game is it's an unbelievable, unbelievable version of the game, but God, it's brutal. <laughs> like you think the contact is a little bit like, I don't want to say looser, but because it's like one-on-ones, there's that almost higher risk of injury from that contact, but then it's over so quickly. So you have to be like highly sp- Strong. Today's episode has been brought to you by Rival, my agency. Now, if you're listening to this and you're a business owner and you're struggling on how to get your brand to go to the next level, then we're offering you a free discovery call with myself and my team. 
All you have to do is go to rival.com, R-I-V-Y-L.com. You need a name for your company. You want to do package design. You need to do photography. Whatever it is, we've got you end to end. So just go to rival.com, R-I-V-Y-L.com. Smash the link for a free call. Versus the 15s game that goes for 80 minutes. And as I said, there's a lot more strategy. You've got a range of body shapes and sizes because you've got bigger scrums, bigger line outs. So more people involved in smaller spaces. So you can have, you know, a hundred kilo girl and then you've got a halfback that's maybe a 50 or 60 kilo girl. So you've got this range of shapes and body types, but everyone serves a purpose on a 15s field. So I, I don't know. I personally love the 15s game because of its traditional nature but then the sevens version is just an unreal spectacle and the athletes are truly specimens yeah and you have a preference to play 15s for for what reasons because i didn't get picked to play sevens so i've chosen (laughs) my sport based off it choosing me um (laughs) i definitely started playing sevens because when i was transitioning from netball the idea of playing 15s was far more intimidating you know the athlete in sevens is quite a you know, a thoroughbred, you know, they're, they are truly incredible. I was lucky enough to dive into the Aussie seven space very early in my rugby career. Um, and I trained with them for two years. I ended up going part-time in my master's degree so that I could try and train and crack that program. And unfortunately the coach just one year said, thanks, but head back to, you know, club land and, and, enjoy rugby you know this isn't the end but like stop training with us now like we've seen what we we needed to see and you're not quite there Uh, it was that conversation that sort of sparked in me like well okay if I'm not going to make this team right now am I am I really going to get faster than I am probably not like not to the speed of some of the girls in this team like that's not not you you can't really teach speed. You can you can tweak speed, but sometimes it's like there's there's only so much capacity you can improve. So that side of it, I was like, well, I'm probably not going to get faster. I didn't come from a touch footy background, so the idea of like passing a ball backwards, the you know 15, 20 meter passes that they do, not my skill set. So if I'm looking at me personally and where I sit and my opportunity is kind of like a business model, I suppose, if you're genuinely like reflecting on where's your opportunity in the market. I was like, 15s. I don't want to, but I'm going to have to try it. Tried it and was like, okay, well, I was an idiot. Why did I wait this long to try it? Like, (laughs) this is a great game and this is the game I'm meant to play. How do you figure out as an athlete, like when it comes to rugby, like what best position plays to your strengths? I think the position picks you in a sense. I started as a back because I came from sevens. So they were I was a forward in sevens because I was a bigger sevens player. And then you go to 15s and you're a small player. So they put me in the backs. And I was playing in the centres for a little while. And I realised that, I think I realised, my coach realised that I'm supposed to be following the ball. Like my job is just to do the dirty work. I now play in the back row and ultimately, and this is not by any means putting down back rowers, but we are a work rate position. We are not necessarily... What do you mean by work rate? We're not necessarily fancy and skill, but our job is to hit breakdowns and do the dirty work for the team because we just keep going. By dirty work, what, what exactly do you mean? So my job in defence is to try and get over the ball and be the one that they have to try and get rid of. So it's sometimes one of those positions that isn't like making massive line breaks and doing all of the fancy things, but it's like the, the engine room of the, of the team. You know, we're not making the plays, we're not creating, you know, the fancy stuff, but then there is also skill to it that, you know, like if you can turn over a ball, that's a huge opportunity for us to then play. In it's a difference in winning a game. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like, if you look at, Scotty Pippen, Dennis Rodman or Michael yeah. Jordan. I understand that Dennis Rodman was just extremely talented at getting the ball back into the right player's hand and that could turn a tide of an entire championship. Yeah, but he's not necessarily the name that you then go, he's a superstar. Mm. You're looking at the ones that score the points and that's our wingers. You know, it's the same sort of process that like everyone plays a role but there are 
certain people that become the the shiny names because they're the finishers. But then you'd also say, well, hang on, but that's their job. So it's funny that they're the ones that get the names. It's not, I'm not taking it away from the ones that have the name, but, you know, like sometimes like, well, hang on, like the only reason they got that is because eight people over there did something four phases ago. So that's why the beauty of a team sport is that you, like they can't do it if we don't create the space for them. So I, I think that's like the beauty of team sport is there's always got to be a front face teams, business. There's always got to be a, a front face and then there's that work workroom behind that is creating and helping for that name to be seen. Now within the team dynamic, because I understand that, you know, everyone has different roles to play. Does stuff like this create tension among the team? Does it create any animosity or any difficulty among players? I mean, if it's creating animosity for you personally, you're probably playing with an ego that you shouldn't be. And I'm lucky you can't be the one that's doing it. It's like <laughs> everyone should know where their role is. And I suppose, you know, if someone wants to try and take that opportunity and thinks they can do it better, go for it because that's going to make our team better. But ultimately, like it's a team sport. If you can't celebrate your own teammates' success and realise that it's also your success. No, well said. Is, is like a culture that's set into the team almost from like a – this is what's expected of you dynamic when you're playing with other people. I don't think it's necessarily set in like the Wallaroos or the Waratahs, but I think in team sport in general, like you don't make it up the ranks or, you know, like you don't grow or progress in teams if you hold the wrong kind of attitude. You know, they, they always say they, pick the person as much as the player and the skill set can almost sometimes be taught, but it's the character that you can't teach. And I think that's becoming a bigger part of team selection that I'm seeing across a lot of teams. Yes, you have to have a baseline of, of ability and you have to have like the characteristics that say you're going to work hard and you're going to keep growing as an athlete. But if you have the wrong kind of people in, in places you – generally don't go very far. I would say the same thing in business. Like when we're hiring people here, you know, even if they're, I guess is a skill gap, but they've just got the right attitude. It, it's better to have that individual than someone who has a poor attitude and a great resume. Yeah. Within the sporting space, I think we have the presupposition that it's all physical strengths and speed and power and all the rest of it. You're shining a light on that. It's actually more around the mental fortitude than, than anything else. Obviously you have to have a base and you have to hit a KPI of fitness and, and what have you. What are some of the things that teams look for uh, in people before they can make it into the big leagues? That's a really good question. I don't know what, like, like if there was a list, I think it would be out there and everyone would be working on those things. So I think it's, it's not something that you can have like a, a tick box on. It's like, I don't want to say a feeling either, but there's, there's things that make someone like, good in a team environment, be it in business or in sport. And that's, you know, your willingness to celebrate other people's wins and be a, be a team player. Do you think you're better than other people? You know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm going to tell you what I think a good team well, what do you, be. What do you think? Cause it's almost like, um, we have a joke that we do in workshops with clients and oftentimes it can be difficult to try to guess who the target audience is or whatever. Yeah. So we just have a joke and it's called a WAG and it's a marketing term. And our clients are always like, what's a WAG? A and it's a wild ass guess. Okay, nice, nice. <laughs> so if you had a wild ass guess of like, I think it's like these things like that that they look for. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, I'll have a WAG and I reckon it's got to be around like that team first mentality, like having that ability to sort of realize that, yes, we want to be, I want to be there individually, but like I am one of 15 or 23 or a squad of 30. So my selfishness can't come in front of the success of the team. So I think that that side of it is massive. I don't want to say someone that like picks up the kit and is like, you know, conscious of their environment, but in the same breath, like being the person that doesn't think that other people are beneath them is also really important. Like no one walks into an environment and owns it. Like you create it. So being a part of that being, you know, like, oh, someone's got to take the water bottles. Someone's got to pick up the rubbish or, you know, like 
I just used a chair and a table and a laptop. I'll just leave it there. Like that kind of person doesn't really fit because if there was 30 of them travelling on a tour, there'd never be a laptop that was charged and then everyone loses. You know, it's just like, again, team first sort of behaviours. I think you've got to have competitiveness because it is a sport, it's competitive, it's a competition, everything is competition, be it, you know, competing against your teammates at training for selection or competing in a game to try and win. It's all competition but there has to be that element of like humbleness that goes with it because you have to remember that you're there for greater than you. I mean, I'd like to say you've got to have a good personality, you've got to be, want to be part of the team, but not everyone needs to be an, like an extrovert to, to fit in because the beauty of the 15s game is that you travel with 30 players. You can't have 30 extroverts in one room. You have to have <laughs> some people that are happy to just go with the flow and do their job. Like that's the, like teams don't have to be all of one type of person. You do have to have some big characters. You do have to have some quiet ones that don't mind, some ones that like to wake up early in the morning, some that like to go to bed late. Like you want to have a diversity of people. You just want to know that you're all like hardworking and, I don't know, in the right, going in the same direction. And that's not like we want to win a World Cup. It's like understanding what the long journey is and how to how to be part of the journey, not just focused on that like destination. That makes sense to me. And when you think about the team dynamic, I imagine that there's on the field dynamics and then off the field dynamics. And I imagine that they both kind of feed each other. If you're doing poorly on the field, it probably creates issues behind the scenes and vice versa. Have you, have you seen, um, you know, the culture um, shift because of what's happening behind the field and, and on the field? Yeah, absolutely. I think when you can come together off the field and it can be over the smallest things, be it a night out drinking together and bonding in that social side or something that you're super passionate about together that sort of brought you, be it as bad as this might sound, a unity of not liking a coach. <laughs> like that can bring a team together <laughs> to no end. Um, Have you seen that recently? <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't say too much. Uh, maybe in the last five years I have yeah. seen that, absolutely. Like <laughs> definitely in the last five years I've seen that in varying levels of the game. And I think it's incredible because you still have to work for that person. You still get selected by them and – as a group, you also have to connect and go, not stick it to him or her, but like, let's do this together. And I think, you know, that that sort of sounds silly, but we've even in the last couple of years, as the Wallaroos posted a, a public announcement about how we were feeling mistreated by Rugby Australia, our governing body. And that's a pretty intimidating and powerful thing to choose to do, but because we did it, we had to stand together as the players, which then meant that kind of everything rode on our performances. So you have to then pull together and feel this connection that, you know, you maybe wouldn't have had because you didn't go public. And I understand that you, you know, before you talked about luck and I think, you know, luck comes and goes and we make our luck in many ways, you know, by just repetition and discipline and showing up, you know, luck appears. I wouldn't say that, your debut was luck because when you had your debut, you became player of the year. And now, you know, you're within the leadership team as well. What kind of pressure did um, player of the year put on your career? And then is it similar to being in the leadership team? Uh, no, it's not the same as being in the leadership <laughs> team at all. I think I was, I don't want to say naive, but at the beginning of a career at that level, I didn't have anything I was thinking about. I didn't have pressures. I didn't have people ready to judge me already. Like my first- Clean slate. Yeah. Also want to preface, and this is not to take away from the fact that I got player of the year, but I got player of the year in a year of 2018 when we played two test matches for the year. So the team, Australia women, only played two games. 
So I kind of just got to ride that in, like endorphin dopamine like roller coaster of like oh my god I'm debuting for my country and then I'm playing a game two weeks later for my country again in New Zealand and no one had any time to like criticize me or analyze me or I didn't have time to do it to myself um so in a in a way like I didn't get a chance to put pressure on myself after playing well in game one because they you know game two happened and that was the year and I, I really don't want to take it away from myself because like that will, you know, live on a trophy forever and in the history books and I know I deserved it. But in the same breath, like I didn't do any overthinking. I didn't have time to overthink. I had a roller coaster of emotions going into the game thinking I wasn't, it did not even realising that I was in the mix to be picked for the game to then just going out and I reflect on that debut and just go I we play structure we play a game of rugby union where there are rules and I didn't follow any of them (laughs) like I just like I'm sure we spent the week in the lead up learning structure and I also don't remember any of it like if you like genuinely like there's moments in the game where like there's a moment where we had a scrum on the left hand side of the field and I was playing number six. Job of a number six, everyone knows the job of a number six when you're in defence is to hold that short side. Scrum started to turn. I just go, oh, I'll follow the scrum and the ball all the way to the other side of the field. Like if they'd swung back, there would have been space where I was meant to be because no one else holds your space. They're doing their own jobs. I just follow the ball, lucky enough to get off the line and get an intercept. Don't go for, like, I don't go for intercepts. We don't practice going for intercepts. Like why I thought this is what I should do, no idea. (laughs) But I got the intercept and the coach afterwards was like, if you didn't get that intercept, we were in so much trouble. And I was like, oh, well, lucky I did. Like, you know, (laughs) just like almost oblivious, which is an amazing place to be. If you reflect on like how much we overthink things and how much we put pressure on ourselves, the way I played I didn't have any pressure on myself and maybe I just like I always grapple with that idea of like how much work do you do for like the mental preparation for a game and like a mental preparation for sport and then sometimes I think as an overthinker in life why the do we have to over like if you know you've done the work why do you need to then go okay I'm going to breathe in and I'm going to visualize me scoring like don't know you've done the work and just go and play but then obviously the longer you play the more you're like well you can't just rely on feeling good all the time and so I think that's sort of where the progression goes is like I was not lucky but I created my luck from just trusting a process and taking opportunities that were given to me to now being like well if you know that you know you're regularly there you can't rely that every day you're going to have a good day and you're just going to turn up and play well. So you need to pull on other skills and resources that you that are given to you and that that is the mental game. Um, it is being able to visualise. It is being able to write like and follow a structure and a routine. Like all of those things are how, you, how I create my luck, I suppose. But I do really want to say, because I've been thinking about this recently, Yes, it's about the person off the field, but if you, we just rely on that, we're never going to be good enough at what we do because you can have the strongest mind, still not be able to catch a ball, and then you're still not a good enough rugby player to be picked. So I think that there's an element of like what I think and I value is the the human being, yes, but then also how you work on your skill. And work on your craft is not just the recovery and that seems to be the thing we talk about the most now. It's like the new the new thing. Everyone talks about recovery and mindset. And I think they are massive. But to me, if you recover all you like, if you're not better than anyone else at passing and catching or tackling or line outs or scrums or whatever the skill set is that you need to do in your game, the recovery means nothing. Would you say that there's an element then – of obsession and recently i was in um 
Miami and I was doing a keynote and um, Tom Brady was there and he was doing a Q&A and he was getting asked questions about obsession and the nature of such. And he was saying things like, look, you know, oftentimes, you know, people on the team would go and hang out for drinks or go watch a movie or blow off steam or whatever. And he said that he'd be there watching old games and he was trying to pick up tactics and tips. Like he became ruthlessly obsessed with finding that little edge over his competitors. Where, where would that obsession stem from for you? If you're looking at all the rules of the game, but then you're also taking into fact that at your debut, you kind of went against the rules unknowingly. Like how do you find a balance and, and where do you try to point your obsession when you're trying to improve? I think you've always got to be really self-reflective on what your strengths are, what your work-ons are, and then be realistic about what the investment of time is going to get for an outcome. You know, we... A lot of people talk about like, let's get better at your, you know, what, what we're not quite as good at. And I agree, but I also think there's a reason you have a strength. And if that is your superpower, make it your superpower and keep it your superpower. You can always, you know, I think you should work on both. I don't think that, you know, you just say, oh, you know, I could get better at contact, but we'll just leave that one because I'm actually really fit. I think you've got to work on both, but I think that the obsession has to come from firstly a desire to get better and secondly because you care. And then thirdly from your thought process on on what it is and then how. I don't know. What do you think? Where does obsession? Yeah, I, I've wrangled with obsession as a concept for a long time and – in my brain, at least when I meet people that aren't obsessive, um, it, it confuses or baffles me. It's kind of like, why? Like it, it seems alien to me. Uh, but then I realized that everyone's obsessed with something, whether it be you know addictions or vices or watching Netflix or gaming or collecting things or gambling or whatever. Like we all have addictions. It's just, I find that for me, it's, it's taking that energy that would be, you know, in something like I love collecting, for example. So then I'm like, look, rather than collecting, um, you know, comic books, which I, which I love to do, I have many Spawn comics or Walking Dead <laughs> comics, um, and I spend far too much money on it. I'm just like, what is that obsession? Like, wh why, why is that there? And I'm like, can I point that toward my business a bit more? Can I point that towards my personal brand a bit more? And, you know, oftentimes people say things like, well, you know, I'm just not excited about social media. I'm like, try to find a way to get obsessed with it. Like yeah. just try to gamify the process. So for me, I think obsession is something we innately have. It's just where we point it uh, defines our success. Yeah, I like that. I have an obsession with ice cream. How do I point that <laughs> to help me with rugby? <laughs> or, or yeah, life? I have an obsession with ice cream too. I've been uh, <laughs> hitting gelatissimo far too often. And my <laughs> excuse is I have a four-year-old daughter and it's daddy daughter date. We've That's got to beautiful. get ice cream, right? I don't have a daughter or a son. <laughs> What's my excuse? You know, it's like, oh, I need that release, man. Like I'm wound up, you I know. I work hard. I work yeah. hard. This is my treat for myself. Now back to, uh, I guess, representing your country, because I think this is a really interesting concept, right? You know, uh, many athletes out there strive to wear a jersey and then the moment they put it on, it like really hits them. Uh, and it's quite a defining moment for many. Representing your country on the global stage carries like an immense pride and pressure, as I can imagine. What did it mean to you to put on the Australian jersey for the first time and including that of singing the national anthem? Yeah, pride. Pride is the first word that comes to my mind when I think about representing Australia. Um, as you said, it's something that so many people grow up dreaming about or or thinking about or watching on TV, be it, you know, just regular test matches or international games or Olympics. Like there's there's like this pinnacle idea that it's, well, it is the top of your sport, it's, you know, getting to be that like one, two percent of probably the nation. That's a really thrown up, made up stat, but one to two percent of the Australian <laughs> population would represent their country. I just think it's yeah, it's it's something that you dream about and then to be able to to make it a reality 
comes from hard work. And so that pride factor is not just pride in representing Australia, but it's knowing that you've done everything to be there. Like you've earned this blood, sweat, tears, sacrifice of time and what else have you taken away or, you know, made choices in your life and maybe missed out on things to get there. And I think like that's that's the moment. It's not just for you. It's, it's for all of the things that you've said no to to get to that point or the things you've said yes to to get to that point. And I think that's like, yeah, the, the national anthem is – probably one of the worst in terms of keys and tone to, to sing really loudly and proudly <laughs> and potentially be heard on national TV. Goes viral when you get it wrong. Absolutely does. <laughs> but I think, you know, to be able to say that I have belted the national anthem out pretty much every time I've worn an Australian jersey is something I'm truly proud of because not many people do get that opportunity to stand side by side their teammates facing the crowd and your family <laughs> sing before you play. Regarding the, the jersey as a concept, like I have this, you know, discussion with my mentor often around, you know, the power of having an alter ego. And we talked to uh, Olivia Vivian about this and she competes in Ninja Warrior and she has like this alternative version of herself that she clicks into gear when she's competing. When you put the jersey on, you sing the anthem, are you priming yourself to, to tap into a, an alter version of your ego to play at the level that you play? I'd like to say no, because <laughs> I'd like to think that every game I play, I play with the same amount of energy and expectation on myself and with a desire to be the best that I can be, whether it be in an Australian jersey or a New South Wales Waratahs jersey or a Sydney Uni Club jersey or over in Japan or in England or wherever, you know, whatever jersey you put on, I think you want to do the same thing as you want to play the best that you can. You want to do your job for the team. So there's an extra element of like, damn, this jersey has the, you know, the crest on it and it is it is Australian and you want that to mean something more Mm. But you also, uh, for me, like, I guess it's an armor. Like you do put it, but I would say I put it on an armor every time I get onto the field. Then I also put on headgear because that helps me as that armor sort of principle. So maybe it's more when I put my headgear on that I feel like I'm s setting myself up to to go to battle and to, to do something great. Yeah. I, I used to have this um, weird thing I would do because I played rugby in high school. And I would, um, so I would play on the wing yeah. usually because yeah. I had speed and I was a skinny, tall kid. Uh, I would get messed up in tackles, but I, if you gave me the ball, I could, I could disappear. But I remember- um, Superpower. <laughs> yeah, it's my superpower. But I remember before uh, a game, I'd put my headphones in and I'd play um, The Beautiful People by Marilyn Manson. And it would just put me nice. in a state where I was like, I want to destroy people. And I remember walking on the field and like shaking people's hands, whispering the beautiful people to them while I'm listening to it, just to psych them out. And then also to pump me up, like I'm going to smash you in this game. Do you have anything that you use to prime yourself before you play? Because that was uh, something weird I used to do to just get me in a, a pissed off state. <laughs> See, I am just like, it's so interesting talking to people about the mindset of going into a game of rugby union or going into competition because some people work on anger, some people work on like getting pumped up. I listen to The Greatest Showman. Love that. I listen to songs that make me feel really good and happy and not necessarily about performance, even though like, you know, This Is Me is is a bit of a performance I think what I reflect on why I listen to this music is it's empowering and it's not about I'm not I'm not angry, I'm not aggressive, I don't go out to try and hurt people, I'm not the most physical person. I'm like do it, do it again, piss them off because they are never getting past me. I'm going to keep working, I'm going to keep going. So the idea of being able to go out there and go like <laughs> have fun. This is me. Like, it doesn't matter what you throw at me. I'm going to keep coming or this is the greatest show. And like, just that, like, I don't know, it just like, it makes my chest pump rather than like 
angry music. I'm like, oh. well, you could tell I was an angry teenager, <laughs> right? Angry 16 year old walking out in the field, staring yeah. at people aggressively, yeah. whispering the beautiful people, shaking their head, and just thinking, that's I'm gonna... terrifying. <laughs> yeah. Whereas I'd be like the one that's like bouncing along with all this extra energy, being like, I can't wait to go out there and have so much fun. <laughs> so, like, I truly like, I write, um, sort of three or four focus points for before every game in a in a journal and without a doubt every time one of them is either like stick it to the man or show them who you are or have fun mm. like one of them has to be like this is your time to shine show the world who you are or go out and play with a smile because you do this because you fucking love it and that is my energy. Like that is, that is me. I'm not going to change that. So when like people try and get that, like, how do you, how do you get up for things? I'm like, I just have so much fun. <laughs> like I want to piss you off because I'm there all the time and I've still got a smile on my face. So that's, that's my psyche. I really love that. And I think it, it's, it's shining a light on your personality, your demeanor and how you, you stay pumped yeah. as a person as well. Minus uh, Marilyn Manson. What, <laughs> what tips or advice could you give to, I guess, both professional and emerging athletes um, when it comes to dealing with all the pressure? Because as the career builds, right, like you're now aware of all the rules, you're aware of all the things you could do wrong. And it, the, I imagine the pressure increases over time. Pressure is a privilege. Like as soon as you feel pressure, you know you, you're making it in the right places. And I think, you know, I we love talk that. We talk about nerves and fear and I think nerves is something that you should embrace and fear only exists if you possibly haven't done the work or you don't feel that you belong in that space. How do you delineate between nerves and fear? Have you done the work? So if you've done the work and you have the nerves... You're in the right place. You're in the right place. And that's where the pressure comes. And fear is maybe a sign that you haven't done the work. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think you you can walk somewhere that you've never been before and be like, ooh, this is a big stadium. Ooh, that's like you kind of it's, – it is a mindset. Like I think the, the emotive feelings or like the reactions that your body give you between fear and nerves are the same. Interesting. Yeah. So, so then how would someone really – how would you really separate the two? For those listening. The mind. Believing, like trusting that you've done what it takes to be there. Like what is, like what is nerve and what is fear? It's like an increased heart rate, potentially a little bit sweaty, turning turning tummy, like you might be feeling a little bit sick. If you go, oh, my God, I'm, I'm, I'm so worried I shouldn't be here, like you have to go, well, hang on, have you done the work? Did you earn your spot here? Like does someone else believe in you? Yes. So if you can – take that into like a self-belief or if you need to go to an external place and go, well, someone else selected me to be here, they trust that I've done enough. Like whatever your, you know, some people don't work with internal, I don't know, self-ratification. Like some people need that external like reassurance. It's been made for you if you've been picked in a team. Someone else has decided you're good enough to be there. So you got to use that external pressure, or external feedback to say this shouldn't be fear, this should be nerve. And I don't know how you change that otherwise, but for me it's like if I'm verging on the like I'm this is too much, I'm like hang on, I've worked really hard to be here. Like I've earned this. This is nerve and nerve is good. It may be a sign that you care Yeah. as well. Yeah. Whereas I think fear comes from it has to come from some uh, some place of of lack of belief in yourself, and that doesn't like I think that does lead to that pressure side and say well pressure is something that is created possibly by yourself, so if it's a nervous energy that you're leaning into the pressure, like diamonds are created from pressure, right? Like sometimes the best things come from feeling a little bit uncomfortable and you should embrace that pressure rather than being like being afraid of it. If you walk away from pressure, you're probably never going to like see how good you could be. Yeah, it's almost like you could see, you know, 
pressure in whatever regard, like as an athlete or, or in business, as an invitation? Hell yeah. I, I like to look at pressure as an invitation because I, I think you're right. Like when you when you have the nerves, because you can, you're a human being. We're gonna feel emotions, right? Things are gonna crop up. You're gonna get sweaty. Your stomach's gonna turn. I'm getting sweaty just thinking about it. <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> what What are some things you've um, uh, I guess beyond anchoring to, okay, people believe in me. I have a support system. This role was created for me, X, Y, Z. What, what are some other things people can just generally do to um, build self-esteem, build self-confidence? What are some things that you try to do in, in life and in, and in your career? Mm, I'm a routine girl. I found a lot of value, reassurance and comfort in knowing that I have a plan and that's a weekly plan, a monthly plan, like every Sunday without a doubt I've written on a piece of paper my full week and that's training, that's work, that's when I want to do something social, when I want to like whatever it might be, I'm fitting that on this piece of paper and if it's written on the piece of paper, it's going to happen and I think that for me that's how I build that trust in myself that I've done the work when I reflect back, I'm like, well, if I write it down, it's happening. And if it's written down and I have to change it, it has to be written somewhere else on that piece of paper. Um, I've also been reflecting a little bit through this injury period that like sometimes you need to go through the, the ebbs and the flows of routine to have no routine to then appreciate routine again. So you can't live your life doing like following a strict routine all the time because you burn yourself out and it gets boring. Um, but I do also think that like almost losing control is really important to be able to then regain control. So that's one of the things that I really hold on to is trusting that I'm doing the work and knowing that I've written it down to do the work in terms of like being intentional of like thinking like I'm going to have a moment to visualize. But if you ask me, can I picture myself doing all of the great things that I want to do in a game? And yes, I, can, I have like a highlights reel that plays in my mind. I know, what do you do? Well, that you, you struck an interesting point. My mind, here in my mind, went to I've seen this video of Conor McGregor online, and he talks about how before a fight, he plays how he he believes the fight's going to play out in his head again and again and again and again. And there's this famous video where he said that you know, before a video, he's like, "This is how I'm going to knock him out. I can see it in my head. I know the maneuvers, everything I'm going to do." He almost like completely Nostradamus predicted how the fight would play out. Then the fight starts and it goes according to how he imagined it. And maybe it comes back to the nerves and fear thing. It's like he played it so much in his head to kind of maybe remedy the nerves perhaps, I don't know. The interesting thing I think with visualization is something that has a lot of woo-woo attached to it. And I, I oftentimes on my walk to and from work because I have an eight minute walk here and an eight minute walk home. And every time I do that walk, I try to remove any distractions, phone calls or anything. And every morning and every night I play uh, a series of soundtracks and I, I imagine the next three to four years of my life in fast forward. I do weird shit. Like I imagine my bank account scaling. I imagine my social media numbers going up. I imagine, you know, my team growing and us in our new building. And like, it, I just, I need to feel what it feels like in the future. So it's almost like I'm not, for me, it's not about the manifestation component. It's about, I want to feel it. I want to feel the future and bring that feeling now. And for me, when I when I do this in the morning, I just I feel like I get to work with an energy or an aura of like, this is happening, let's go. Versus fingers crossed, I hope things go my way. I I try to psych myself into an emotional state. And that that's what manifestation quote unquote does for me. I got two questions for you on that. Yeah. First question. Do you ever so when you are doing your thought process of the the next three or four years? Every day, mm -hmm. does it change? Yeah, all the time. 
in, in many regards, like depending on what my focus is that day, I'll, I'll focus on that. There's a lot of repeats. Yeah. I have like, because uh, when I listen to certain, music is a really great way for me to kind of shift emotional states. So if I wake up in the morning, I'm tired, I'm pissed off, I haven't had my coffee yet. I'll put on music and I'm like, I feel this way even though I don't. And I start to on my eight minute walk, moving the body, I start to feel a lot better. The endorphins hit, the dopamine kicks in. But there's certain images I play in my head again and again every day, but there might be nuances or differences to different things. On a bad day, do they go negative ever? I Not when I'm doing the process, because I think I've kind of anchored myself into doing it a certain way. But I do wake up in the morning oftentimes with a lot of um, head noise. Head noise, And I recently did something called, um, it's like a, a wake up journal. And you can try this. And it's like the second you wake up, grab a pen and just start writing. It's the weirdest experience because you have to remember to do it. <laughs> but when you literally wake up, you open the notepad and you start writing in it, the most disgusting, vile, awful thoughts come out of your minds. And you're like, holy crap, this is my unconscious. So I always, I always try to catch that unconscious dialogue um, and then flip it into something positive if I can. What That's about you? Really cool. I don't know. I don't, I don't do the – I don't – everyone has to have negative thoughts, right? Because if you don't have the negative thoughts, you're not really thinking about the whole of life mm. because there's always a chance of something bad happening. As again, we've said multiple times in this today that, you know, it's how you react to something that, that matters. The experience makes you stronger. So I think sometimes thinking about the negatives, like you don't want to sit as a pessimist, but you never want to sit too much as an optimist. I agree. So you have to find that middle ground as a, as a friend, but as, a, as an individual for success as well. Like if you're always the person that someone, that when they come to you with a problem or you know, a thought, you're always the positive. They won't listen to your positive, like, Interesting. affirmation. When, you got to have a dynamic. Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, in everything we do in life, you have to have a dynamic. So when you're talking to yourself, if you only ever throw the positives at yourself, how do you build your own resilience? You know, you say your bank account is is growing in the next three to four years. What happens when it goes backwards? Have you Have you emotionally, like built some base resilience on how you would deal with that. You have to deal with it when it gets there. There's a funny thing that I, I love what you're saying here. And it's true. Cause again, it might sound like I'm a brutal optimist, but I'm very much, you know, as my Marilyn Manson story, there's a dark side of me. And I think <laughs> um, Jim Rohn, uh, someone I listened to and, and he's, he's just a really funny kind of, you know, um, I guess, keynote speaker that has passed, but I, I listen to his stuff often. And he said, it's really good to have a list of people you want to prove wrong. And at the top of my list is my high school principal. You've got to tell us a story. <laughs> Very much at the top of my list. And, and it's just something kind of petty, but it's like, it's just something that pumps me up. Because it, 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 in a, I think if you can have a few dark thoughts Sometimes you need to reach into what David Goggins calls the cookie jar and you pull out a cookie and you're like, yes. I'm going to use a bit of this energy. And, you know, my high school principal, you know, said to me, she said that you're not very intelligent. You're not going to amount to anything unless you straighten up. Like you're going to be an absolute failure for the rest of your life. And if you don't get past year 12, you're never going to succeed. And I saw her um, a couple of years later in... Um, in a bookstore like four years ago. And at this point in time, I had a lot of success and I walked up to her and I said, Hey, do you remember me? And she's like, day. And I was like, Hey, what's up? Just want to let you know, I didn't finish year 12, but I'm making a lot of money and this is what I'm doing now. And she was just like, oh, and I just walked off. But for me, that cookie was so sweet, man. And it can sound <laughs> like absolute pettiness, but like, it was just something that I had in my mind. Do you have those things that you carry with you that maybe someone said, that do fire you up and is a little bit of a dark, a dark concept. Yeah. I've, I've talked about it already today, that coach in 2017 that said that you're not big enough. We're playing against the biggest teams in the world. And I think I've always used that. Like that was the last time I didn't get picked for Australia. It's not quite true. The last time I didn't get picked for a tour 
for Australia. We'll go with that. And I just rem- like I've, I've held on to that being like it's the simplest way to say a big F you of like guess what, still the same size, now I'm making it like using that. And I, I had to sit with those words for a while before I could turn them into something positive. Like I remember the first, I don't know, two months being like, what do they want me to do? <laughs> like I can, look, I can play with heels. Like what do you – like I can't <laughs> stretch myself. Yeah. And And feeling like a little bit helpless with the comment to then turn around and go like – Okay, show them what else you've got. Like, no, you don't have to be the biggest player, but I'm going to work out how I can use my size and my strengths to prove that you need me. I definitely am not a malicious person, so I didn't play my first test match and go, ha ha, to him. <laughs> like, that comment, him as a like person. Like me uh, in the bookstore with yeah, my principal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, maybe it wasn't quite the same. Like, it's. That was definitely my version of ha ha, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Whereas, like, to me, like, the person that said it means so little to me in my life that if I'm wasting my time trying to find him to to say ha ha, I don't have time for that or the money, to be fair. <laughs> um, but I've taken the words and the feeling that the words gave me and I've used that as my cookie. And I think, you know, there have been a few comments that I've got throughout my career as as a female rugby player that – you hold on to and you go, fuck you. You know, like this is my stick it to the man, you know, moment, be it women shouldn't do this or you won't make it or oh, girls, g- girls, girls play rugby, you know, like those little things that like slide under and you're like build it, hold on to it. So when I run out there and you go, oh, is that a girl play? Oh, shit, she's actually quite good. Like I know that I'm winning. I don't yeah. need to say in an interview at the end of the game. You'd be like, yeah, I'm really good at tackling people. What? You know? Yeah. (laughs) Come on, let's go run it straight. Like that's just not, that's not me. So I just, I take the, the words and, and use them for sure. in that David Goggins kind of. Yeah. I love his book. Yeah. Yeah. When I read his book, I hated running. It's and so I remember funny. listening to his book and I wish he read it. That's my only, the only thing is because I listened to the audio version. So did I. I guess in conclusion of everything we're talking about today, you know, how, how do you really want to be remembered, I guess, when you, when your career is, is coming to completion? I suppose you want to be remembered for the, the person that you are as well as the player. Um, like your play, your on-field reputation kind of verifies the person that you are, I'd like to think. And I, I guess if I reflect on like what my values are as a person or what I'd like to, you know, like I'd like other people to feel when, the, when they're around me is number one, curious, because I think I am naturally a why. I feel like I'm still that five-year-old kid that's just learned what why means. And I want to know the silliest things all the time, but I also think you can't grow if you're not learning and you can learn about anything all the time. So I always want to be known as like that curious person that's like open to growth. I want to be known as a dependable person or an accountable person, someone that you can always trust to turn up if they say they're going to turn up or do something they say they're going to do. Hardworking. And I just want to be known as that person that like I'm not the loud, funny one all the time. I'm a big thinker and a hard worker and I'd just like to be known as someone that has sort of worn their heart on their sleeve and put put things out there but also isn't afraid of the confrontation. If I were to give you a two-word brand at this point, it would be joyfully relentless. I like that. <laughs> so you're relentless but you have a smile on your face. Yeah. That's very smiling you. Smiling assassin. <laughs> the smiling assassin, that's another one. What's a quote or a mantra that you've carried with you on this journey that you wished everyone listening to this would immediately implement? Trying is cool. Yeah, I think it's something I've really brought into club rugby and I really stand by it. And I think particularly in Australia, we have a huge tall poppy syndrome and we're afraid to do something if 
success isn't like the most obvious option straight away. And if you can be around people that pull you up or celebrate you putting in the work to try something, your opportunities become so much greater because firstly, you're around people that want to see you succeed and will be there for you when you don't. And secondly, you get that opportunity to take people on your journey. So, you know, I use this as a simple example at, at Clubland. If you want to get fitter, message the group and say, hey, I'm going to be at training 15 minutes early. I want to run. See how many other girls will turn up and run with you because it's so much easier to do it when you've got the accountability there. But also this is a team where we are all here because we want to get better. So why are we afraid of trying? If you want to get better at passing, ask someone to pass a ball with you 50 times before or after training. Like it's so easy to do a couple of things extra, but we're always to too afraid of the failure that might come if we try passing and we don't get better at it straight away. Yeah, almost almost like the fear of uh, going through the learning hurdles. Mm. Yeah. Um, when you wake up in the morning, what keeps you going? Mm. I don't want to say it's easy, but like, I don't know, life for me, like you choose, you choose to wake up with energy. You choose to wake up and go, today's going to be a good day. So I think the choices that we make in our outlook on life really define how you set yourself up. Um, and I think that's where like the energy and the positive outlook come from. It might be a natural disposition for me, but I think it's also a choice. Like I can have a bad day. I can be grumpy. But if I choose to then laugh and have fun on that grumpy and bad day, far out it goes away so quickly. Like you realise that the tension you're holding on to, sometimes you're creating and you can choose to enjoy life and choose to see positives. So a positive mindset. Well said. I think, you know, when we look at life, uh, it, it's a choice, right? You know, people think that feelings come first. I think, you know, if we can train ourselves to guide how our feelings reflect things, I think we can choose to be happy. We can choose to, you know, do the little things that surmount to the big outcome. We can also choose to like try and be successful because it's not, it's not easy. And if it was easy, everyone would be successful. But if you don't have the intent to work hard to do it, of course you're not going to be. So I think like the intention of, of like, yeah, hard work and, and wanting to go somewhere where people don't normally go is a pretty cool place to be. Like if you reflect and go well, like, no, no one else chooses to do what I'm doing right now or very few people are willing to hurt as much as I am in the gym knowing where my outcome is going to be. That's why you're successful in business or in sport or whatever it is you're doing because you're choosing to do more than someone else. When, when you're faced with, I guess, um, the injury at the moment, is there any athletes that come to mind for you that you draw inspiration from? Um, I hate to say no. I haven't <laughs> really. Like, I wish I had a really like inspirational answer for you here, but I think everyone's journey is so different. And if I was to look too closely at like Sarah Hirani, who's just come, did a, did a six or seven month return or say Khaleesi who plays, is a South African captain. He came back in like 112 days. I got to 112 days and I was like, oh my God, I can't even run yet. And this man came back and played. Like the inspirational stories are often the ones that you see and they're the one percenters. They're the ones that almost make your journey feel less valuable because you're comparing yourself. So I haven't really looked at anyone individually and thought that's who I want to like hold on to as a like part of this journey. But instead I've sort of gone like, okay, how, how do I use this to make my journey better? And I've gone like, okay, I'm going to listen to, because I can't read self-help books. I can only listen to them because I need to think too much whilst I'm getting the information and I don't get through pages. So I've been listening to like, 
culture books and team environments and like winning in the locker room and like all of these kind of like Brene Browns, like I've been diving into that side to try and make my journey better when I come out of it. So I've got more perspective on things when I re-enter. Different answer. Sorry, it's not beautiful a answer, but phenomenal. Thank you. And last question: What's a door you need to kick in to go to the next level? Fear, I think, because like that mindset thing, like particularly around an injury like I've got at the moment, the statistic says that you're going to do it again. Once you do one ACL, there's such a high chance of doing either the same one again or the other one. And I think the older I am in this game and the potentially less amount of time that I have to play, the idea of doing this again is terrifying, but it's a very possible reality. So accepting that I say fear and I'm like, am I afraid of it? No, but I am afraid of doing it again for the journey, like to have to be, have to find the resilience in a different capacity to say, to not say poor me. So I think, yeah, kick in the door of fear to say I have done the work and trust my body and what will be will be. Beautifully said. I've enjoyed every minute of our conversation. I think you have an amazing mindset and it seems like, you know, your approach to this uh, is admirable. And, you know, I, I only hope that you have a fast and, you know, epic recovery and no repeat injuries. Um, and we look forward to seeing you back in the game. Thank you so much, Dane. It's been such a pleasure to be on the share with you. Thank you. Today's episode has been brought to you by Rival, my agency. Now, if you're listening to this and you're a business owner and you're struggling on how to get your brand to go to the next level, then we're offering you a free discovery call with myself and my team. All you have to do is go to rival.com, R-I-V-Y-L.com. You need a name for your company. You want to do package design. You need to do photography. Whatever it is, we got you end to end. So just go to rival.com, R-I-V-Y-L.com. Smash the link for a free call.